I'd also been involved in, um, in uh, searching bodies just the week or two before. And there'd been a battle and um, they'd called for intelligence support to have a look for any captured documents that you could get from the trouser pockets and all yep. the rest of it. And I remember being perfectly capable of doing that, even though it was messy and horrible. But in those moments, those dark moments when I came out, I couldn't help feeling, couldn't help remembering the photographs of those blo- those dead men's families. That there was wives and children in the in the photographs in their wallets. That's what stuck in your mind. And that's what stuck in my mind. Yeah. G'day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Butterfield Effect. My name's Isaac Butterfield. If you didn't know that, an absolute shame upon you. And it's very exciting to be back this Thursday. We've got an amazing guest. We've got a gentleman who was not only a part of the Australian military in Vietnam, but he was also an ASIO Special Operations Intelligence person and he was collecting information on everyone and probably me during this episode so all i can say is i'm terrified i'm worried i'm stressed i'm exhausted but you know what my beard looks good ladies and gentlemen and that is all that matters at the end of the day ladies and gentlemen this is my conversation with ted flack ted hello thank you very much for joining us thank Uh, you for your invitation that's all right it's a very serious podcast Good. Uh, we have here. It's very formal. <laughs> I called you sir out in the in the corridor, and you pulled me up on it already. Yeah, so uh, yeah. lovely to meet you, sir. And um, <laughs> let me let me ask you this first up. You're obviously of of a generation older than mine. Do you know anything about myself or anything that we have done previously on the Butterfield Effect? I did have a bit of a look on the net. That's concerning. And, um, <laughs> Uh, I was particularly interested in some of the news um, stories about you and some of the controversial um, 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 commentary that okay. has come out as a result. But I was talking about it before I, uh, I came here today, and uh, I rather like people who kick over the, um, the the norms and have a look at it from a different point of view. So I'm entirely comfortable. Good. I'm glad to hear that because if, if that went the other way, what you were just saying, then, then this would be a long hour. <laughs> tell, me, tell me about yourself. Tell everyone at home, uh, who are you? What have you done with yourself? It's a long story and it's a hard one to answer straight there, but perhaps we should start with, uh, with your youth. Well, um, I was born into a family um, in, immediately after the war uh, who in Scotland. Um, I have my wife who's Scottish does not like me claiming to have been born in Scotland, but I was. Um, and uh, but to Sassanac, um, uh, mother and father. So that means uh, um, my father was in the Royal Army Medical Corps. He was a doctor, and he had served in Burma during the Second World War and had had a pretty bad war. He had been wounded in the face, um, and um, my mother. She was a um, particularly vivacious, outgoing sort of a lady. Uh, she'd been a model before the war, and uh, she'd had a bit of a um, uh, she, she'd had a bit of a um, um, a stoush with my father's parents, because she continued to go out with other men during my father's absence in the war. Right. So she was not popular uh, with my very stern Lancastrian grandparents. Um, so I was, yeah, I was born there. Um, we moved relatively quickly to Southport, uh, which was the hometown um, of my mo- my mother and father to some extent. And I went to school there for the first time. We then got posted, my father got posted to Egypt. So we went to the Canal Zone, which was then a um, part of the British Empire kind of thing. And um, I went to school, first of all, in a place called Ismailia, Ismailia. And... Um, it was a French uh, convent school and uh, um, learnt French and spoke French and um, uh, as best I could uh, with a pommy accent. And uh, um, then the, the riots, the, ab- the, um, the, um, the uh, uh, Colonel uh, Nasser started to cause trouble in the riots in, in Egypt. A lot of people probably won't, don't know the history behind yeah. why the British were stationed in Egypt. Could you perhaps give us a bit of a, an understanding of why they were there post-World War II? Well, look, it goes all the way back to um, 
1815, I think, or I've forgotten when the Battle of the Nile was, but it was around about that time. The French had been the dominant power in Egypt, a colonial power in Egypt. And then when the French were defeated, uh, the Napoleonic armies were defeated in 1815, uh, the British took over and they installed a, um, a, um, um, an Egyptian king. And uh, that king was advised, if you like, by British um, uh, bureaucrats to rule in a way that was uh, um, friendly towards Britain. And of course, the canal was very important. Mm. And Britain's empire, particularly India and Australia to some extent, um, and uh, South Africa, for instance, were all pretty important. Uh, the, the, um, the, the Suez Canal that the French built was all pretty important to um, its security was pretty important. And so the British um, continue to dominate uh, the politics of Egypt. And then they separated the canal zone so that British troops could be stay stationed there, but not in the actual, um, not in the actual country of Egypt. It was restricted to the canal zone. So you couldn't get into Egypt? Yeah, yeah, you could, but the British army wasn't allowed okay. to deploy in Egypt. Gotcha. It was just in the canal zone, which was Egypt. Mm. It was just artificially partitioned. Were you welcome? How old were you at this stage? Um, well, I arrived in Egypt when I was five, okay. and I, I left Egypt to go to boarding school um, when I was seven. Mm. Yeah. One thing I'd like to move forward uh, to talk about is something that I really wanted to do for a long time. And that was, I was in a position similar to you where you were working at a bank straight after school. Yeah. And I was, I was working as a storeman. And I thought to myself, what, do I, what am I going to do with my life? I was sort of like, this mm. isn't you know, what I really want to be doing. Mm. And I started to have this idea that you know, I really should be involved in the Australian Secret Service or I should be a spy or something <laughs> like that. But you were involved with ASIO. Yeah. And we can talk about that. We can in general terms general because terms. I signed secrecy um, papers when I left to say that I wouldn't talk about any operations or, or any individuals or anything like that. But in general terms, I can talk about it, yeah. Now, I've heard stories from people who have applied for ASIO and they've had people come to their house or people take photos of them while they're out. And was any of that taking place or, or t taking place while you were approaching that as a career or was it just, just uh, in the earlier days of ASIO, more, more or less people just trying to get people in? Um, Look, as far as I know, um, it was based on on who knows who stuff in those days, recruitment in ASIO in those days. <clears throat> I mean, they didn't, they didn't, they wouldn't dream of putting an ad in the paper, mm. whereas now they do. In those days, it was very much a network of people who you know and trust. And um, my father, having spent all of his life in the British Army, the vast majority of his life in the British Army, as an officer, a uh, doctor, mm. meant that another doctor living two doors down from us, whose wife's brother was in ASIO, was a, a contact, somebody who you got to know, went around for a barbecue. Um, and he, he, he asked me, what because I, I was leaving school, doing my leaving certificate at the time, and he asked me, what, you know, what are you doing? I said, oh, you know, got a job in the Commonwealth Bank and I've just done my leaving certificate and I'm gonna go to uh, Sydney Uni and do my economics degree. And uh, he said, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, you know. And so that's the way it started, by being introduced to somebody. And therefore, I would have been what in modern terms you'd could be called a, a prospect, mm. a prospect. And then when I got in a little couple of years older, then I got the telephone call saying, you know, I'd like to meet you. I'm so-and-so, so-and-so from, um, from the Commonwealth Attorney General's Department. Mm -hmm. um, would you be prepared to uh, to um, uh, to have a further discussion following the discussion you had with um, John so and so? And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we met in a in a um, in a uh, an old fashioned milk bar, you know, with the with the, the booth seats and all the rest of it. Um, what was that like? You're meeting with a guy from ASIO. And... Oh, well, I didn't know it was ASIO okay. at, that, at that moment. Okay, yeah. that's probably a good thing. Yeah, because you would have been freaking out. <laughs> And so we sat down and uh, he, he started asking. And at the end of the second interview, which I had in a, an, an off, a, a, a nondescript office in the centre of Sydney, mm. Sydney, he said to me, um, would you be interested in applying for a job in 
um, a, 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 an important and, um, and secret organisation that works for government. And I went and looked at him and said, yeah, what's that about? And he said, well, um, and then um, signed the document, nothing that you say from here on in will be recorded and you're not allowed to talk about it. So I signed the document and it turned out to be ASIO, yeah. Wow. Within a month, I was resigning from um, the Commonwealth Bank and um, trying to find out if they could, if ASIO could help me move my uh, economics degree to Melbourne University because I was being posted to Melbourne. And I was in my Volkswagen and pedalling down the Hume Highway down to Melbourne. So what, what goes through your mind as a young man, what, 18, 19 years yeah. old, now going to work as a, for lack of a better term, secret agent for the government. Well, secret agent is not the right word. Well, it's um, it's um, it's not unlike the army, really. Right. In in mindset, to me, it would be it's a it's a unique and special hmm. uh, special organisation, and um, you um, are going to have to submit to the discipline of mm-hmm. the organisation, and I. I I wasn't particularly apprehensive. I was probably, if if apprehensive at all, it would be about the unknown mm. rather than about the nature of what it is that I was going to do. See, I think that, <clears throat> and I'm sure ASIO are watching now because, you know, why well, not? That's fine. You've got to do something with your day. <laughs> I always thought, and particularly now, with yeah. me on the internet as a comedian who's travelling around the world, that I would be a great prospect because no one would ever think that I'm involved with absolutely anything. I would just be there. Oh, there's that guy from the internet. Meanwhile, collecting data, information. Will you be my reference? I guess that's my question moving (laughs) in through here. I I just think it would be a really, really interesting job and you get to do a lot of strange things. Things have changed a good deal since then. Now it's a much more rigorous recruitment process. Uh, where they would, you know, they'd want to do psychological and uh, attitudinal and personality and all range of things, which they didn't really do then. Mm. They really based based their thing on, well, he comes from a good family. Um, um, the family's always been loyal. Uh, clearly, their um, their politics are are um, in line. Uh, in line, blah blah blah. Mm. So much different now. Mm. That's a shame. Uh, <laughs> so tell me, you, you worked, how long did you work with ASIO for? Ten years. Ten years, and then you ended up in Vietnam. Well, in the middle of that, in the middle of that, um, I think I, um, um, I, I discovered that, you remember you have to register for national service. Sure. And then your n- number was taken out of the barrel. Mm. You remember that process. Well, I registered, as every, every other person eligible did. And uh, to my shock and horror, no, no, I shouldn't say that. To my amazement, my ball didn't come out of the barrel. However... Just, just for people, because a lot of younger people will be watching this, can you take us through that process? Because a lot of people don't understand national service. You know, a lot of people who are born watching this may be born in the yeah. 2000s or the late 90s. Well, um, all that happened is that you get the form, uh, you fill in the form with your date of birth and all the rest of it, and you send the form in. And when it goes in, it's got a serial. It's got a serial number on the top, and the serial number goes in, and then um, the uh, and your date of birth goes in, and then um, in the Department of Army, I believe, I'm not absolutely no Department of Defence. I should, sorry, Department of Defence. The Department of Defence then had um, um, all of the birthdays of a particular, all of the cards of a particular. Age group. So, if you were born between the first of January, um, um, nineteen forty-five, and the thirtieth of June, nineteen forty-five, mm. then all of those entry forms would be avail- would be in the barrel, and then they would literally, like a, a lotto ticket, they'd pull out there. Okay, that all the people who were born on the fourteenth, who've got cards in the thing, they're called up. All the people who are born on the twenty-first, they're all called up. What was the reaction from the wider public to that sort of... Well, at the very beginning of the Vietnam War and national service, there was no real anti-reaction because, I mean, it was all within living memory of the Second World War and uh, uh, you know, everybody saw the army as being, well, all the parents said, ah, oh, it'd be good for you, young man, you know, you'll get, they'll sort you out, you know. They, they all saw it as being a good thing. Mm. 
So there was no sense of aggro. However, by around about 1967, 68, which was three years into it, the anti-Vietnam War movement had started to um, build and build and build. And the, there was a, a, a strong left-wing anti-conscription um, 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 movement started up. And so you then started to have the people who were prepared to go to jail for not registering and people who were called up but refused and blah, blah, blah. And so the, the papers started to talk about that and that built the movement yeah. considerably. And why was that negativity, do you think? Oh, look, I think it's the 1960s, 1970s, you know, this, the Beatles, the, um, the, the, uh, the new pop culture, the freedom, sexual revolution, uh, all of those things were saying, you know, and a new generation of people who weren't of the Second World War generation, and therefore, the, you know, the, the state interfering in people's lives like that, they shouldn't yeah. be doing that. It's, mm. This is, we're in, we're about freedom, mm. about expression, about, um, <clears throat> you know. And I mean, that, that does, it does make sense from, from that point of view. Yeah, yeah. But how does that affect someone who is, who is, and, and you, and you weren't constrip, constricted, but you were, you put yourself basically in I, line I, to, to do that. You, you well, the re main reason for that was not, not a sense of duty or responsibility or I wanted to go around with a rifle in my hand or anything like that. It was because three or four of the people I was a cadet in ASIO with were all going in. Oh, right. And the bosses all said, good on you, mate. You know, that'll be yeah. really good for you. You know, when you come back here, there'll be a good career here for you, you know, blah, blah, blah. And they're encouraging them, you know, to take a positive view. So I'm going, well, if you're living I'm with staying your mates, here to do the firing. Yeah. If you're living with your mates or you're around them all the time and they're all going off, you exactly. can't exactly. not go. Yeah, exactly. And how, what was it like being, you went off to England straight after that, is that correct? I did. Um, I, because my next of kin yep. had actually, <clears throat> my mother and father had actually moved back to England. My mother had never really settled in Australia. My father loved it. But my mother was constantly at it. Got to go home, got to go home, got to go home. So um, they went back and uh, with my younger sister uh, and my two older sisters stayed. And... Um, uh, they went back. And so because my next of kin was in, I was entitled to um, pre-leave, um, uh, mm -hmm. leaving, uh, uh, leaving Asia, oh, going on leave, extended leave from Asia, I, I took um, a fortnight's leave, spent an absolute fortune on BOAC because, uh, I mean, in, in dollar terms, the dollars are pretty much the same as you pay now, only then you were earning 10 times less. Mm. So... Race back to Britain for a quick for a quick um, um, farewell to my parents, and then um, was that was that based on the idea that you may not? I might not return? come back. How how does one prepare for that, that or have that mentality going into going overseas or into a war zone? Well, I hadn't I hadn't actually joined the army yet. This was pre. Okay. pre the actual date on which I had to um, report for duty. And so it was more to do with my parents, my mother particularly, wanting me to go and, uh, and, 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 and see them before I left. Um, I knew that I wouldn't be able to do that for at least two years because I'd be in, in national service. Um, I'd got leave from um, Melbourne University for my for my, um, to suspend my um, economics degree. So it just all seemed the right thing to do at the time. I don't think I was thinking, oh, I'm gonna get killed, I better go and see. I, I wasn't thinking like that. It was more to do with making sure I got the boxes ticked and go and see them before I go. Yeah, sure. Again, that notion of duty rather mm. than emotion. Mm. Just get the ducks in line, yeah. So you came back from England. You reported for duty. I did. Um, Swan Street Barracks in Melbourne. And got off the bus and um, into it. So a lot of people are walking in on that same day. Oh. Uh, what's the feeling like? Um, is there a sense of joy in the air? You're about to go on an adventure or is it more of a... There's a mix of those things. Because there's some weeping parents at the gate. Sure. Um, and there's some shyacking going on. And there's... Um, some fear 
of the unknown, uh, some excitement, some like saying, um, you know, um, um, you know, this is this is a license for a beer. What do you reckon, fellas? Mm. You know, or you know, there was a whole yeah. range of emotions. Yeah, because mm. it must be a confronting thing to walk into. Obviously, you've yeah. already had this experience with ASIO. That's already sort of that military sort of. Yeah, but also in the um, in the um, in the what was called the CMF, the reserves, because I'd already joined the University of New South Wales Regiment. Gotcha. So I'd already, I'm always always already familiar with the military environment, and of course, I've been brought up in a military environment. I, you know, the last home we had in, in Aldershot in England before we came to Australia uh, was um, in the middle of the barracks. Mm. So it wasn't a shock It's just to life. Me. It's just normal life for you. Yeah. Travelling over to Vietnam, mm. what, so you go from Melbourne. Do you leave from an airport in Melbourne? Where, where do you go from there? No, no. We then went to what they call recruit training, uh, yeah, recruit training battalion, RTB. Yep. One RTB was in, um, um, in Wagga, Wagga Wagga. Okay. It's called Kapuka. Kapuka, yep. Yep. So you go there and you get your basic training. Mm-hmm. And then your basic training, at the end of the basic training, you're ranked. And if you come in the top group, you get your choice of cause. Well, no, you don't get your choice. You get seriously considered for your choice in cause. And I'd put down intelligence score because of my ASIO background. And obviously it would make sense to mm. go in the intelligence score. And I went to the recruit, I went to the, um, the allocation parade, as they called it. And the major sitting behind me, he looked up from his piece of paper over his glasses and he said, they tell me you're a bit of a stirrer, so you're going to the catering corps. I went, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, no, 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 no. He said, with a name like Flack, you're going to the uh, anti-aircraft. Uh, I, I, no, 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 no. He said, you've done very well. You're going to intelligence corps. So um, then down to... Um, the School of Military Intelligence at Middle Head, as it was then in Sydney, and do your basic training. Um, unfortunately, the basic training um, had to be suspended because the whole uh, basic intelligence training, because the whole uh, school was being moved to South Australia. So we moved over a week, moving furniture and picking up desks and putting them in the back of trucks and all the rest of it, mm. down to Woodside in South Australia, and there was an old hospital building in the barracks there, which was going to be taken over temporarily by the Int Corps. So we moved there, and I had some funny, good experiences there, good, happy experiences, and I loved, loved all the training and all the rest of it, and it wasn't, wasn't different, wasn't hugely different from the training I'd been getting as a cadet in ASIO, but ASIO does what we call human intelligence, mainly. Mm. And there is a branch of the <clears throat> intelligence score that does human intelligence, which means talking to you in order to obtain from you the information I need. So that's called HUMINT. And um, we got training there, and that was almost exactly the same training as the, we were getting in ASIO. So I felt totally comfortable. Mm. Uh, some of the other areas, like you know, TechInt and um, SIG, SIGINT and all those sorts of things were... Totally new, which were good. It's good. So with with the humint, yeah. What type of is it? Interrogation skills? Is it just, you know, you're walking somewhere, you're trying to get information or something like that? What is the sort of basis of that? Well, there's 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 various modes, if you want to call it that, or various styles, if you like. Um, um, if you if you are eliciting information from somebody who doesn't know that you're eliciting information, that person is called a contact. And that person is um, uh, somebody who you go and talk to in a perfectly normal way and you slip in the kinds of um, questions that you're after into that. You've already carefully worked out that this person may be able to help you with that information. Mm. And then you um, slip that um, kind of um, question in and see if you can get the answers that you need and if you do um, you say well thank you very it was great to meet you and you go your own way do you do that to this day yep you... <laughs> all right now i'm on edge uh, <laughs> although i have nothing to reveal so that's contact <laughs> yes now there's an entirely different process for what we call a recruit an agent a recruited agent the person you're talking to knows that you are who you are and what you're doing and have agreed to provide you with information okay okay and that's an entirely different, that's a much more business-like thing. 
um, operation where you are talking to the person and recording the information that he gives you or she gives you um, uh, in a business-like way. And uh, you go back and question them again and say, well, what did that person look like? And, um, you know, uh, where did you meet him first? And you, you actually, it, it's like an interrogation, but it's, it's done nicely because mm. this person can tell you to go and get nicked if you, yeah. if they, if you don't do it properly. Mm. Um, and in some cases, those people are paid, um, but certainly their expenses could be paid. Um, but many of them are, are doing it out of a sense of um, um, obligation and, and, and doing it out of um, what they think is an appropriate thing to do. So you're equipped with absolutely everything you could need for the intelligence call at yes. this point. Yes. At what point do you get the orders to travel? Go to Vietnam. Well, the first thing that um, I imagined was that I would get sent to um, Vietnam as one of the uh, people in the headquarters at Nui Dat, which is it's pretty much an office job, to be frank, mm. except the office is in a tent. Yes. Okay. However, I was a bit amazed when they said, are you interested in doing Vietnamese, um, what they call colloquial Vietnamese language course? And I said, yeah, yeah, I'd be interested in doing that. Because I'd done Latin, French, and ancient Greek at school and all the rest of it. So I then went down to the School of Languages and learnt um, colloquial Vietnamese, which is the kind of Vietnamese you need to be able to talk to people in the street. Mm. It's not formal training in writing correctly and all that sort of stuff. It's just conversation. Yeah. So I went and did that. And then the next posting I got was to Army Headquarters, to um, Defence Headquarters in Canberra. I went, oh my God, I'm not going anywhere. It's all been a waste of time. But it was only very, I was there only six, eight weeks. And then the call came, you're going as a reinforcement to somebody who's been uh, wounded is quite not quite injured um, in um, Vietnam um, uh, in the field in the field intelligence. You're going as a, re a replacement to that person, and I said, "All right." So climbed on climbed on the uh, on the uh, aircraft and went um, went to um, Singapore and then across to uh, um, across to uh, uh, Tan Salut, which is the Saigon Air was what's mm. now called not called Ho Chi Minh City now, but was Saigon Airport. And from there down to Vung Tau, which is one of the administrative bases for the Australian forces in uh, Vietnam, just at the bottom end of um, Phuc Thuy province, which is where most of the troops were. And then after a while, um, I, I, I had to interview the guy who had been wounded. Um, um, a wee bit sensitive, so I won't, I won't yeah, talk sure. about his circumstances, it's not fair. Of course. But um, I then um, went to replace him in the village called Zuyen Mop. And Zuyen Mop's at the far eastern end of uh, Phuc Thuy province. And my job really was to liaise with the local police, the local military um, um, uh, commander, and the, the, the village hierarchy and that sort of thing. When I say village, it's now quite a big town, but it was only relatively small there and uh, so um, I've had a Vietnamese interpreter to start with, Nguyen Cao Siu, very nice man, very well educated, been to Sorbonne University and all the rest of it, Vietnamese. And after a little while he left me and I was left on my own, there. not absolutely alone, but um, but to operate as a field intelligence or NCO. Yeah. Wow. So that's how it worked. <laughs> it's, it's a long journey from, you know, from Australia straight to Singapore, then to Vietnam. I assume you're by yourself, or at least not with people you know really well That's right. at this time. What type of thoughts collected your mind? Are you just going over the things you've been trained, or, or are you just living in the moment? Is there well, fear? It, is there worry? It, it's a bit like football training, which you'd know about, I'm sure. Sure. And that is that you go out and do all your football training pre-season, and you're working out who your mates are, and how it all works, and how it all fits together, and what your routines are. And then somebody says, would you like to go and play football? Let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah. Wow. So that's the emotion. Mm. Yeah. And where you were stationed, what was that like? Was it a, because people may be thinking a battle zone, is it, is it more of a well, city? It's a... Well, as you, I'm, I'm, I'm reluctant to give you um, too much um, in terms of the political and, and um, historic and all the rest of it background. Essentially what it is, is a small town made up of two kinds of people. One group of people are 
the original inhabitants of the area mm. who've been by the South Vietnamese government told that they must go and live inside the town because the bush in that area, both the bush and the some of the rural properties in that area, were now being infiltrated by Viet Cong. So they were um, two kinds of Viet Cong, local village people who actually recruited locally, and then there's what they call the the um, um, area um, units, and they were full time Viet Cong. So D four four five, which was the name, name of the unit which was involved in that famous battle of Long Tan. Mm. Um, they were infiltrating and operating in small groups all over the, 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 the uh, less well-populated area. And there. So the South Vietnamese government said to stop them from recruiting and stop them from getting food and, and blah, 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 and information, we will require all of the population from that area, probably four or 500 people, to move into what they called armed hamlets, armed hamlets. <coughs> and those armed hamlets had barbed wire around them and lookouts and, 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 and um, like army reservists looking after the perimeter. And during the day, people went out and did their business. They weren't supposed to go into the, the, the cleared zones, but many of them did. Um, and I was in that village. Now, the second group of people are people who used to live in North Vietnam but in 1956 or 1954, whatever, and my brain's gone to sleep on it, 1956, I think, when Vietnam was split into North Vietnam and South Vietnam, large numbers of Catholic North Vietnamese people fled. I think, don't, get, don't quote me, but I think 1.6 million people fled south. Wow. And they were relocated in all these rural areas as well as the cities. And so in the town, most of the what you'd call middle class, people who'd been involved in business, people who had contact with Western, um, a lot of contact with Western cultures and that sort of thing, they tended to be the ones that came from the north. The locals tended to be Buddhist, so they didn't like the Catholics. Mm -hmm. They tended to be Buddhist and they tended to be local. Okay, And there was tension between the two. And when talking to these people, they saw... The Buddhists saw the government of South Vietnam under Ziep, Ziem and all those people as being the posh wealthy who don't understand the Buddhists who are Catholic and pro-American and all the rest of it. Whereas the people who came from the, the north who came and lived in the village, they tended to be, we fled those dreadful, those dreadful people up there and, you know, isn't it great that we've been given a chance to re-establish ourselves down here and, Thank you for coming and helping and all the rest. Mm. So they really didn't talk communism versus free Western. No, they didn't talk like that. It was all more about, as I was saying in the car on the way here, more about the tension between Scots and English. Right. It's, it's, okay. that, it's that Yeah. different culture. That undertone. Undertone. Yeah. yeah. Of just like, you, yeah. you give oh, them yeah. a bit of a look. You know. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so my job was to work with these people and try and... and work. Now, what does a 21-year-old, up Dailoi, that's what they called Australians, how does he make friends amongst that mob? I had an absolutely flukish, flukish insight as a result of a recording, would you believe? And I'll explain it to you. You'll feel really comfortable with this. One evening, we, we have a, a system in the army of, of called <coughs> Stand 2. So on dusk and on dawn, you gather up your gear and get ready to move in a hurry. So it's called Stand 2. And one evening in the, in the, heat, of the, in the heat of the summer, I'm sitting in this, in this mud and, and thatch um, building and I could hear this singing. And I said to um, um, somebody there, I've forgotten who it was now, what's the singing? And he said, singing? What's singing? I said, Can, can't you hear it? It's like wavering in the, in the dusk. Oh, he said, that, that'll be them plant, the women of the village planting uh, um, uh, rice. He said, what they do is they line up in uh, knee deep in mud. They line up and they've got a basket of seedlings in the back. And as they sing, they take a pace forward in time with them, the, their song. Oh, wow. And they put the seedlings in and that makes the job go a bit easier and everybody's working together. So, all right. so what do they sing about? He said, oh, some bullshit, you know. He, 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 yeah. 
So anyway, the following day, in order to start up a conversation, I said to this middle-aged lady in the village, I heard you singing last night. It was beautiful. And as the sun was going down and the sun, it was a hot day and the insects were all making noises. But over the top of it all, I could hear this wailing kind of song. What do they say? Oh, she got all embarrassed and looked down and carried on. And I said, come on, you must tell me. Well, well that's another. She said, well, it's a sad story. She said, when we used to fight the Chinese back in you know, hundreds of years ago, he said, all the bodies would, of our young men would come back to us. And he said, and, wid and, and, and the widows or the mothers would receive their fallen troops on their shields. And this was a ceremony to hand the shield over to the parents for burial. And he said, and the ceremony has, this song is about that ceremony. I said, oh, that's a wonderful story. I said, I, I had no, I said, I, would you tell me, can you, can you give me the word? No, I can't give you the words. Oh, right. So I, next time I was back in the headquarters, I said to one of the sergeants in there, I said, what's the chance of my getting a tape recorder? Because in those days there were Sonnies about that big and that square <laughs> and two reels. You know? <laughs> and he said, no, nah, you can't get it. So I spoke to one of the officers. I said, look, I think I could make friends with a lot of people with one of those because they never seen one of those bloody things. He said, oh, yeah, well, we'll see if we can, what we can do. A couple of weeks later, the chopper came out and I got the bloody with a gadget to attach to my Land Rover to recharge the batteries. So, so I went over to this lady and went to see her at a program and I said, can I get you to sing the song? And I said, I'll play it back to you. So anyway, to cut a long story short, everywhere I went in Zwin Mop and around that area, I was welcomed. Hassi Ted, Kale, come here. Hale, we've got a song for you. Ah. So I'm established really good. And that was a total fluke. It was not intended to do that. But it really worked well. Probably a question none of no Western had ever asked no. is what that song was. Yeah, and it's quite um, quite profound to think that they're still singing about you know their oh, fallen loved their ones culture, hundred yeah. years hundreds yeah. of years later. Yeah, yeah. What, what what an interesting place to be that different culture, oh, particularly absolutely. at a young age. Oh yeah. Well, I wouldn't tell my wife now, but um, she won't say this. <laughs> I wouldn't tell my wife now, but um, I probably would actually. Um, but um, uh, there was one of the young ladies that uh, made me think very seriously about staying. Ah. I wanted to stay. <laughs> Been there probably seven months or eight months or something. <clears throat> I really felt at home there. It was they were very kind to me. They really were. People who would say to me on you know they'd say, "Hassie Ted, why don't you come over for tea and you can teach the kids some English." You know. Yeah. So that's beautiful. They it, trust you. They did go into their home. Well, some of them did, and not all okay. of them did. Um, but of course, at the same time, I'm writing intelligence reports. Yes. Um, and on one occasion, um, got a bit of a coup. I said to this lady, I said, um, um, who, whoever goes out on that road, you wouldn't think that would anybody go out on that. You're not allowed to go out that way. Who would go there? She said, oh, there's one man who goes out there on his tuk duck, what they call, mm. well, you know them as tuk ducks, but they do call them something else. They, you know, one man goes out there every week. I said, oh, really? I said, oh, yeah, well, who's he? He said, oh, he's the bloke. I said, oh, right, okay. So I said, do you know anybody out there who lives down there? Yeah, she said, my cousin lives down there. And she said, well, where does he? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, which the way does he go when he gets to the fork? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. So we plotted this, and uh, they determined that he was actually resupplying rice to the VC. Oh, wow. And as a result of that, they were able to conduct operations to, to clean up the... Uh, but that's just... Simply talking to one of the locals. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Was this a dangerous place to be in, in, in this camp? Look, it probably was because the, 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 um, the RNC, what, the, the, the local militia, if you like, were not terribly trustworthy. If anybody okay. came towards them with an AK-47, they'd probably run away. Mm. So it would be, it's perfectly possible that the place could get a, a raided or overrun. But they wouldn't, it wouldn't be a smart thing for them to do because 5K away or 8K away or something like that, there was a the fire support base, um, um, whatever it was called, with 155 millimeter guns on it. Okay. Yeah, bad move. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so it is a dangerous place but you're more likely to get murdered with a knife rather than attacked by a formal, mm. a formal. And in fact, 
I got one warning, which probably did save my life. Kid came in running in one night and said, um, Hassie Ted, um, Mama San say you no sleep here tonight. And I looked at him, he was about eight or nine years old. I said, Who, who's your Mama San? And he just turned around. So I turned around to one of the other Vietnamese. I said, what, what does it, I oh, don't take it out, it's a bloody kids, you know, blah, blah, blah. I said, look, that's a really unusual message. Who's Mama San, you know? And maybe it wouldn't be a bad idea if we did move. So I moved out of the hut that we're normally in. I went and saw one of the, he actually ran a tea shop, this bloke, and I said to him, any chance I can sleep on your veranda tonight? He said, yeah, yeah, no worries, in return for some English lessons. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, it's all right. So I slept there for two nights, and then nothing happened and there were no incidents, so I moved back. I didn't do anything about it for a month and until I was back in headquarters, and I walked in the tent, the in, in tent in the uh, intelligence tent in the uh, headquarters, and they all started going, ah, oh, here comes bloody Hollywood. Hey, Ted, has he Ted, bloody Hollywood. I said, what, what, what's all that about? He said, come and have a look at this. Captured document, hit list, Zwien Mok, has he Ted. Wow. Now, whether those two issues are actually connected, yeah. and I got a warning, or whether it's purely coincidental, I don't know, to this day. How do you go seeing that and then walking back into the town? <laughs> <laughs> like, do you, do you, do you, you change you, your trust? Do you... You, you're probably looking over your shoulder a little bit more. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I felt that I was surrounded by people who who, um, who would support me. You know? and, and getting that warning, or if, that, what it, if that's if that what it was, one, yeah, yeah. is often what well, would obviously be a very clear cut understanding for yeah, you that yeah. you know you are welcome there by some of the people yeah yeah and if old mate to let you sleep on his veranda and yeah that, that's such a strange thing to think you could be in a war zone and yet you're, you're making friends well it's a, it's what you call low-level warfare which means that it's a, a guerrilla warfare it's a bit yeah. like being in if you're a german soldier being in the french resistance in in, in second world war sure. I mean, your vast majority of your time you never see anyone but when it goes bang it goes bang and you mm. get killed you know did you have much contact with the Viet Cong? None at all, other than some dead bodies, yeah. yeah. Wow. Because it, it, it's strange for people to hear that, you know, you went to Vietnam during the war and you didn't have any contact. Uh, obviously, you're doing a completely different operation, but you would think as someone, you know, thinking of uh, the Afghanistan war or the war in Iraq that people are, you know, on the front line sort of thing. They have this idea. Maybe it comes stems from the, the Second World War where, you know, or the First no, World War trench warfare. I, 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 I carried um, either a pistol or an F1, which is like a small submachine gun. I didn't carry a rifle or a sub big machine gun or anything like that. My job was, not, I mean, to be perfectly frank with you, my job was to run away if mm. the if the enemy came close. Yeah. I mean, I was involved in one or two operations, but not, not on the front line of them. What yeah. was your uh, impression of war? Many people have said, I think there was an 1850 quote, war is hell. What was your impression? Look, the actual battle is hell, but the vast, ma I mean, you're talking about, in the vast majority of cases in Vietnam, you're talking about half an hour in a year. Wow. The vast majority of cases. Yeah. It's, it's probably the big battles like um, um, the Battle of Long Tan and the Battle of Bin Ba, some of those battles, they lasted a day. But the vast majority of those trips would be involved in ambushes, in, mm. in, um, in very short contacts, literally minutes only, and they'd be over. And the, the big battles were much, much, um, in Battle of Coral, another one, which lasted a couple of days. And that, they're serious head-to-head -head battles with relatively equal numbers, and it's who dares wins then, mm. who, who's, who's, who's disciplined and who's well-armed mm. wins. But the vast majority of a low-level warfare, it's um, they deliberately don't want to have a battle with you. Yeah. They want to shoot at you when you're not looking. Is that worse for a soldier or, or better? Having a year of no combat and half an hour mm. once once in that year, but constantly being on edge, or you know, if, if your front is moving towards where you know a positioned uh, enemy. Look, I is. shouldn't speak on behalf of infantry, of course, because they are dealing with this in an entirely different way to me. But my understanding is that it's the tiredness, it's the it's the uh, tension of patrolling, all of those things that 
make low-level warfare hell, not the actual contact, because the contact takes very few minutes. Mm. Now, it's hell in the sense that you might lose mates in that, yeah. but only a relatively short period compared to the total amount of time you're involved. Mm. I've often wondered about that, watching a series like, I think when I was younger, it was Band of Brothers that I first yeah. watched, and when they're involved in the Battle of the Bulge and, uh, in, uh, in a particular forest, it escapes my mind at the moment. Yeah. But how a human being can go through that time period and somehow maintain a level of mental well, clarity. I have to tell you, I can't talk about that because I've never had that experience. If I'm any kind of judge, it's, 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 it's more about training and instinct and discipline around certain actions that you take at certain times in those circumstances that gets you through it. Mm. So, for instance, in Vietnam... Somebody yells contact front because they've seen enemy in front or get shot at from in front. Yep. There is a drill that happens automatically. No one thinks about it. It's a drill that you go through. So you fall into this autonomous sort of role. Yeah, absolutely. Where you know exactly what you're doing. Exactly. And that kicks into gear. Yeah. Okay. Well, that yeah. makes sense. And then you have to be flexible after the initial part of it. Keep, every, keep the commander informed, your, your, your um, um, platoon commander informed or your section commander informed. And then he... And makes the decisions about variations to the to the to the drill, hmm. but it's um, it's um, uh, it's something that you know you start learning about it Kapuka hmm. way back, and you just keep constantly getting it reinforced, 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 reinforced. Wow, I mean, obviously they do that because it works. Absolutely. What's it, what's it like coming back from a war zone into normal day to day life? What was the transition like? To be frank with you, probably the worst part of my whole military experience. Really? Yeah. You would think it would be the best part. You're getting back. No. Yeah. Um, fly back, arrive at um, Sydney Airport, um, bus to Southern Command, East, sorry, Eastern Command um, personnel depot on South Head in Sydney. Two nights of handing in your gear and signing off gear and all the rest of it. Night, heavy night in the boozer. Um, um, sign all the papers. Um, then given your farewell speech and you're out the door. Gone are all the people, all the systems and people that you've worked with for, for, for two years. Gone. We're told in our briefing, don't wear your uniform out there because there's a lot of people who don't like the Vietnam War and you'll get a hard time. Mm -hmm. You'll get, you'll get pissed. Stay close. Don't talk about it. Keep it, keep it, keep it to yourself. Go back to your civvy work. I've got no parents there. I've got no girlfriend there. I've got no family there. And how old are you? Uh, 23 by the stage. Wow. And the loneliest, most miserable few minutes um, as you as you go out of that that first few days were just the worst everything that I stood for everything I'd worked hard for appeared to be all gone the newspapers are full of <coughs> anti-Vietnam War um, um, demonstrations and all the rest of it um, so I ended up getting on the um, getting on the train and going to Melbourne um, I left my car in Melbourne um, so I got the train down to Melbourne and uh, I wasn't due back to go back to Asia for another because you get a certain amount of leave after, after me. So I wasn't due back to go for a fortnight. So I didn't have a place to live. Um, so I went into a residential hotel, sat in my room. Mm. <laughs> Terrible. Yeah. I think a lot of people face that when, not just from war, but when they get out of a certain job or they get out of something where they're so used to structure. Sure, yeah. Particularly for a military person. Yeah. I know a lot of guys that have come back from, whether it be Afghanistan or Iraq, uh, they've done tours, they leave, they retire, or they, they've just, they're, they're done. And they, one of the biggest struggles for them is structure. And even for me, leaving a normal job and doing stand-up, all of a sudden, I'm just at home. Mm. 
Mm. You know, the structure is gone from your sure, life. Sure. And you're so used to it. Yeah. You live this entire and life. And that's of, when you need your family around you and, mm. and all of that. And you need domestic, a support structure. You need your domestic structure. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I was lost for some time there because I just sort of woke up and thought, oh, what do I do now? You know, mm. you've been told from a young age, you're at yeah. school, you get up, Absolutely. you do this, you do yeah. that. Yeah. Terrifying. It is. Um, and uh, I also, I, I'd also been involved in, um, in, uh, searching bodies just the week or two before and there'd been a battle and um, they'd called for intelligence support to have a look for any captured documents that you could get from the trouser pockets and all yep. the rest of it and i remember being perfectly capable of doing that even though it was messy and horrible but in those moments those dark moments when i came out, i couldn't help feeling couldn't help remembering the photographs of those blo- those dead men's families that there was wives and children in the in the photographs in their wallets. That's what stuck in your mind. And that's what stuck in my mind. Yeah. How, how did that? I don't know why you? it stuck in my mind. Well, that's a traumatic experience, obviously, mm. and and for whatever reason, your brain has captured that moment. It to, has. to call back on. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of people who come back from war zones or mm. experience something traumatic in their lives are mm. suffering from PTSD. And I particularly would think that back in that time period, no one is acknowledging that at all. I mean, Absolutely from the days not. of World War II, World War I was shell shock, yeah. uh, now obviously recognised as PTSD. But even the shell shock people were the only the people who actually were shelled, whereas the, the the general experience wasn't considered to be shelled. Anyway, doesn't matter. The, um, yeah, it was it a was difficult time, and I went back to work um, in, in, in ASIO, um, and I just threw myself at the job, I'm just just threw myself at it and uh, and ended up getting posted, got a promotion and got posted up to Sydney. And it was whilst I was in Sydney that I um, I had um, I um, started a relationship with my first wife, and uh, she had a little girl, and that was helpful. That really was. She already had a little girl, and um, the little girl was being looked after during the day while she went to work by a lady um, who was married, a um, lovely lady, who was married to uh, Tom Nalangi Levu, who was a, a Fijian Tongan, um, a, a very big, huge man, ex-middleweight champion of Fiji or something, something like that. Big, huge man. Kindest, gentlest man you've ever come across in your life. And I sat in the car with him one day, coming back from the gym, and... Um, he said something or other, and I opened up on this business of um, the, the bad memory. And, and he, he gave me one of the best pieces of advice I've ever heard, and it helps me to this day whenever I woke up in the middle of the night with it. He said, I want you to consider your experience in Vietnam, including those horrible moments, putting your hand in the squishy bits and all the rest of it, all those things. So I want you to consider those, the TV um, screens on either side of a corridor that you're walking down, and each experience is on those on those TV screens. And he said, and "You'll be looking at one, and then you look at the other, and then you look at another, and then you look at another, and that will be your total focus." He said, "But there's coming a door in the in the corridor." He said, "I want you to put reach out and put your hand on on that handle, and open the door, and go through. Close the door. Make sure it's properly latched." He said, now look at the walls. He said, they're blank. He said, that's your future. You've got to put the scenes that you want on those walls. And he said, if ever you wake up in the middle of the night with those thoughts again, close the bloody door and think about going forward. And that really helped. Isn't that an interesting thought? Yeah. Yeah. And often that to conceptualise something yeah. uh, visually can yeah. help a lot of people yeah, yeah. with mental health issues and, and, and those type yeah, of things, yeah. particularly with uh, PTSD. I know a lot of people, one of my mates who was, who was in the army, I was over at his house and he was asleep, he was having a nap and I went to wake him up and he'd been through some things over there and he freaked out. He, yeah. he got very emotional and I, because I because I woke him up and yeah. you know he went straight to sort sure. of like something's happening, yeah. and uh, through counselling you know he's he's obviously you know getting better yeah. through time. But uh, to, to, for for that gentleman to offer uh, that piece yeah. of advice for you, and he he's got no special training at all. In fact, mm. he um, 
he had very low level education, come out from Fiji, I think. And, and, but he was, he was a Christian sort of a bloke. He had very strong um, Christian beliefs. And that instinct to care for the bloke sitting next to you instead of shyacking him, I think, I think might, might be the origins of all of that. Mm. But he didn't have any psychological training or anything, as far mm. as I know. Mm. I mean, I think he worked in, worked in the merchant, merchant ships, I think. I think with fighters, they also have this uh, attachment to people around them because they're the only people they know have gone through similar things. Yeah, perhaps, look, you might be right. Perhaps yeah. it's something that maybe it was with. something that he'd gone through. He'd lost a fight, and and his and his and his trainer mm. had said something like, "Yeah, that's true." Who knows? I mean, he for for a fighter, you know, they they put six, twelve months behind themselves to get to one point, yeah. and you lose. Then yeah. all of a sudden, yeah. you know, everyone who's around you at one point has could well have been a trainer. You're quite right. I mean, yeah. I mean, who knows? But uh, to offer that advice, do you, do you see? Have you got any involvement with the military now at all, or moving forward? Did you? Well, yes. Um, okay. After. Um, after two, 18 months or so, I, um, I rejoined, after I'd got to Sydney, I rejoined the, um, the, the CMF as it was in those days. But this time, the reason I joined was one of the people I'd served with in Vietnam um, was now a, a warrant officer in the Army Reserve Intelligence Unit okay. based in Randwick. And he said, look, we need some people who've got some experience to come and reform this intelligence unit. So it's called 2DIV, two div int unit. And so um, it, it had gone very small, it got become very small, and they wanted to re refresh it and all the rest of it. And he asked me if I'd gone join, join him, and so I did. So I then spent all the way through till I was 55 in, in the Army Reserve Intelligence Corps. Yeah. And how do you feel about, people are talking about now with... Uh thinking or well, worrying perhaps uh, with conscription, conscription is a word I can't say today, possibly being an option if there was a further war. Do you think we have or the youth of today could handle such a... Uh, oh, yeah, they can, they can handle it. It's just that um, the important thing is that it's that year before you get into, into any kind of a battle zone that makes us different from nearly all the other armies in the world. We have much better preparation training mm. than most armies do. Um, you know, um, the other thing is that we train everybody as an infantry soldier to start with. Mm. Partial training, anyway. Mm. Partial training, everybody goes through Kapuka to start with. And that means that the, the regime of doing, uh, doing things correctly, um, doing things in drills, doing things... Um, in, a, in a, a clearly articulated way, all the rest of it is, is drummed into you long before you go anywhere near a battlefield. Do you think that's helpful for a young person? A lot of people talk about national service should be, uh, you know, they, they should be forced upon young people. Look, I don't. Um, the military is so different these days. I mean, we talked earlier on about contact front. You remember mm. what I said? Yes. Well, now contact front isn't a drill, it's put the drone up and get the techos to blow. I mean, you know, it's <laughs> yeah. a, a whole different, a whole different world. Yeah. So you need, you need highly skilled and, and um, highly intelligent um, uh, people. You can't just take any man off the street mm. as you used to be able to and train them in 12 weeks or whatever it is. Mm. You, you now, they're all, they're all highly skilled. They talk about having uh, both 50-50 male-female representation in the army, or at least in infantrymen, do you think that's a positive thing? Do you think that's, uh, or, or I, is it? I don't have a problem with it, so long as it's based on capability and not on gender balance or something. On I, I have no problem at all with that. Yeah, I, I, I was in, in the uh, officer training unit here at Waycol, and one of those young women, she was quite short and quite tubby kind of look about her. She was the most warlike person I've ever met she threw herself behind trees and yelled and screamed and charged with a bayonet and all I mean I'd love to have her on my side yeah. in a battle <laughs> you know so I'm not I'm not fussed about mm. what gender you are I'm fussed about how good you are at it of course and I, I think that's for most people that is their their take on that subject yeah. the, the media seems to beat that up as you know we will take absolutely anyone but I think you know no. when it comes down to brass tacks the vast majority of females that would be involved in any Defence Force personnel would be the best, the best of the best, the best available. 
If you certainly got, hope so. Well, I mean, we already know. I mean, did, how often have you flown to Sydney in a, um, you know, in a, um, a Qantas jet uh, f- flown by f- a four-ring female pilot? Exactly. I mean, you put your hands in their hands. Or you put your head head in their hands every Absolutely. day. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So look, there's no issue there. The problem I've got is when you say, "Oh, we've got to we've got to have a 30-man platoon now. We'll have to have fifth, have to 30. Plat- Where are we going to get some uh, some females to fill that number? That's wrong. Mm. That's wrong, because that just brings the whole quality of the of the of the capability of the whole unit down. What you want is where can we find people who are up to this standard to fill the ranks? Mm. Now, some of those are female, half of them are female, three quarters of them are female, great. Mm. Yeah. And they, they find that with gender quite a bit, where yeah. a lot of females in, in, in Scandinavian countries where they say, okay, we need 50-50 and this job, this job and this job, they often find that women don't want to work in those jobs. And if you don't want to be there, you're not going to do the best job possible. But in saying that, as you said, that lady who you had an experience with, yeah. they are more than capable. And if uh, one female is more than capable, that means uh, that any course can they're, be. Of course they are. The only other issue, I suppose, is, is physical strength. Mm. Um, we're getting smarter at how we equip our troops and the weapons and, and carry and all the rest of it are getting lighter. So it makes it easier for more likely um, muscled uh, men and women to cope with it. Whereas in my day, you, you might have a, you know, a, 20, a 20 kilo pack plus a 15 kilo weapon and, and ammunition to carry. And that would be difficult for many women, mm. not all women, but many women. Mm. And they shouldn't be discriminated on that basis. But if they're not capable of carrying that, then of they course. shouldn't be in that role. Of course. But it's changed a lot now. And now the much lighter gear, and so you can reduce those um, those uh, physical characteristics issues. Mm. Yeah. And what do you do now? Nothing. No. Um, <laughs> I like to write. Yes. Uh, you probably heard my stories already. Um, yes. So um, you, I like to write. I get involved in. Uh, we have a family history group. Yep. Um, and uh, I like not just getting dates and places of birth on family trees, but I like to try and write the stories about the individuals. I was t- telling one of your colleagues this morning about the man who stole the cypress. You know, a marvelous, marvelous story, which would, which I think could be a movie. There you go. That's your that's your first major movie. What what happens? Tell me. Uh, oh, well, a swallow pinches. A swallow is a convict. Posted to the most outrageously terrible place in the whole of the convict world, which was Sarah Island in Tasmania, okay. um, Macquarie Macquarie Harbour in Tasmania. Um, he's in, because he's a shipbuilder, and, and before he was convicted and sent, he's involved in shipbuilding. So what does he do? Steals the ship, uh, sails it with a couple of convict mates out of um, Tasmania, and arrives in Japan. So is it without any modern equipment, sails it to Japan. Right. Has trouble in Japan because they don't want they don't like foreigners. So he sinks it, gets in near the rowboat, and they row it across to the Chinese. They they sink it before they get there. But when they get to Chinese coast, they sink the boat, get in the rowboat, and row into one of the ports and say we're um, shipwrecks, British sailors. We need to be able to get home. So the authorities send them home. Free, free trip back to, Beautiful. Back to life. He makes his big mistake, though. He goes to visit his long estranged wife. She's already hit, already She's got somebody on. else, yep. right? And the bloke who's got, got somebody else with dobs him into the as an escaped convict. And so he then goes through an amazing court battle in which he's able to convince the judge that he's not responsible even though he's the, the instigator and the runner of it, or the captain of the ship and the whole lot, he's able to convince them that he did it under duress. The other prisoners were going to kill him if they did, if he didn't do it. So the other prisoners get hung and he gets a trip back to Tasmania. Wow. <laughs> but I, it's such a great story. It I mean, is a great story. I, we, we, we spend a bit of time talking about it in the car on the way. There's so many angles on it. Um, the lieutenant who was the... Um, uh, the, uh, the lieutenant who was responsible for uh, looking after the um, convicts and all the rest of it, plus his couple of troopies. Um, uh, his wife was with him on the barge when on the ship when it was stolen, and they were put ashore by Swallow. And he went to pieces, but she was the strong one, and she ended up making a, uh, helping them make a coracle 
out of basket wear and twigs and, and she used some canvas and put soap on the canvas to seal it for, and then put two blokes on it to go and find help because they were stranded on this out of the way part. And uh, there's, there's, there's actually quite a good pen and ink drawing drawn by one of the soldiers that turned up in the Hobart career or whatever it is of her <coughs> being the boss cocky and uh, the lieutenant guy. <laughs> anyway, he gets court martialed gets um, drummed out of the brownies, stays in, can't get back to Britain because he's got no money. And he makes a series of appeals and he finally gets um, 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 absolved of the problem and um, um, goes on to greet the 63rd Regiment of Foot in India where the regiment's moved on to. And uh, my great, great grandfather was a sergeant major in the 63rd Regiment of Foot and came to Australia. So, wow. so, I've got a family connection with that story, but the whole idea that somebody could sail a relatively handmade boat from Tasmania to, to China in 1834 or whatever it was, 1832, is just an amazing story. Absolutely. Just, just to think that I, I, I couldn't do that. <laughs> At like just at at the front of Dudley Beach near where I live, just for, just to go out past the breakers, yeah. I wouldn't be able to yeah, do that. Exactly. That's terrifying to think that people do that. The convict convict history in Australia yeah. is is people often you know they put it down or they say let's not yeah. talk about that yeah. or it's it's negative. It is fascinating. Oh, fabulous! There is a street near my house where there's a coffee shop that I go to. And down the road is a convict lumber yard where they used to have people in there. It was basically a, a labor camp. And out the front of that convict lumber yard, I'm not sure what year it was, a man was punished for stealing by having his guts sp spilled open. Oh, yeah. And he was left on the ground screaming for a day and a half. And this is right next to this cafe 200 years later. <laughs> it's just incredible to think, you know, <laughs> the memories that this, oh, yeah. this, this ground, this earth has around us. Well, um... <laughs> Uh, this is a bit more controversial than you would probably want on your video. No, but, no, please. Go um, ahead. Look, the people who wrote the history of that era for the Australian historical record um, were, uh, well, they tended to be Irish for a start, of Irish background. And it was during the 1920s and 30s when they were writing this stuff. And that was at the very moment that the Australian population turned anti-British and became very strongly pro-Irish in many ways. Okay. And so much of the original history of Australia, written when I say original history, I mean the written history of Australia by historians, is that written either by academics and, and, and historians who wrote during a period of anti-British um, sentiment, or they're written by um, the Reverend West is a very famous one for Tasmania, and um, there were there were uh, several other visitors, um, the backhouse visitors, and who were very religious. And so, the tenor of the history has tended to shape, tilt things towards. It was the wickish, wicked British imperialism versus the poor people who didn't really only did, didn't really do anything terribly wrong anyway. They should never have been convicted. They were the poor, the oppressed poor. Now, strictly speaking, if you read the original documentation and all the rest of it, nothing further could be from the truth. The simple fact is that many of the colonial administrators, and particularly the, the military, um, they were hugely concerned, and there's some horrible exceptions, but hugely concerned about prisoner welfare, Aboriginal welfare, um, a whole range of, of, of issues um, that they, they tried very hard to do the right way. Now, there were some really bad examples of bad behaviour. I'm not saying there wasn't. But first of all, 90% of all convicts when they arrived here were immediately released and put out to put out as, as, as workers in the fields. And really? The They're going went nowhere near chains. Huh. I, see, this is, no one learns this. Exactly right because our history was written at a particular time and by people who were wanted to paint a worst case scenario. Now, I'm not saying that they were all goodies and everybody did no, the no. right thing yeah. and it's all a lie. Not at all. There were some horrific examples of bad behavior. But to suggest that the colonial authorities were, 
wicked oppressors of the poor is just simply not true. Because we have some horrific stories in Newcastle, particularly oh, yeah. with people building, uh, there's this uh, a coastal bath that was bitten, uh, built by, for the commandant of Newcastle uh, by the convicts and people died building that. Uh, it's called the bogey hole because they referred to this commandant as the bogeyman. Yeah. And then there was uh, the, the chain gang who was building the uh, the break wall in Newcastle and a wave came over and took these people out and they're all joined together. There was Look, six or seven those people. Those things happen because uh, as secondary offenders, people who offended against whatever the rules were after you arrived or people who went, uh, they were allocated as a servant to somebody's, uh, or as a, as a, um, a labourer to somebody's farm or whatever, who then went missing, mm. were then transferred to the worst kind of jails, like you know the mm. ones you're talking about, and put in chains and all the rest of it. But the vast majority, well, for instance, women, they're all servants mm. working in people's houses. Many of them married and, and to local farmers and all the rest of it. It's simply a distortion. I'm not saying, I, I, I'm not saying that there aren't horrific examples of the opposite, but I am saying that it's not a fair representation in my view. Why do you think there's no attempt to reconcile the, the truth or, or, or undistort that distortion? Become part of our culture and traditions. It's too difficult. Tradition. Yeah. I mean, you know, a bit like any, any other tradition, you know, 80, 90% myth and, and 10 or 20% fact. I and mean, in my family, my father died believing that we were Dutch originally with a name like Flack. Not at all. Our name is actually an Irish shortening of Affleck. You wow. know, Ban Affleck? Yes. Yeah. It's an Irish shortening of, of, of Affleck and we came from Southwest Scotland. I've got DNA mm. to prove it. Mm. But my father went through all of his life and his grandfather went, his father and his grandfather went through all of their life believing that we'd originally started in Holland and gone across to um, East Anglia in Britain um, during the, um, you know, the, what was it called? The, um, anyway, one of the revolutions, yeah. So, you know, mm. myth and storytelling and passing of, passing of stories. But there's a, there's a great opportunity for people. I've done the sort of 23 in me, that sort of... Uh, yeah the saliva testing, and, and it's great to sort of see where your heritage lies. Sure. I'm, like, I'm like, I think 2% Scandinavian, mm. you know, there's a yeah. history of some... Well, with a line. red beard like yours, I would expect it's that to be... It's hardly red, Ted. What are you talking about? <laughs> Got no red hair. It's going to be grey at the moment. So that's uh, showing me age there. But, mate, um, thank you very much for joining us on okay. The Butterfield Effect. I thank appreciate you. it. Was there anything you'd like to add before we... Wrap things up here? Not at all. No, no. You've you've um, you've listened to my crazy stories. No, I really appreciate. It. I think I think people will get a lot out of this conversation because there's things we've covered here that people have no idea yeah. existed. I yeah. mean, particularly with the Vietnam War, people yes. just skip over that. It's all yeah. about World War One, World War Two, and now what's happening in the Middle East. Well, we're about to disappear. I mean, um, the the youngest is around about 69, 68, mm. 69 now. So another 10 years, there'll be very few left. I had this conversation with my dad uh, yesterday, mm. and he said it's so important to get these conversations recorded on tape mm. prior mm. to losing people who experienced it firsthand. Yeah, look, I, th I think so. But, but at the same time, I mean, that's history, and you've got to mm. record it, and you've got to remember it, and you've got to, got to um, interpret, interpret it. But I also think that... Um, that many of the underlying cultural and um, organisational issues that um, were present then have changed so dramatically mm. that it's all a wee bit like looking into another culture and looking like, you know, studying Peru or something. It's just, it's so far out of our... And there's so many things going on too. There's so many things that now we have information on. You can invest your time into sure, sure. into anything. Sure. I mean, you know, I went on eBay the other day and bought a 2,000 year old coin Did from you Rome really? for no wow. reason. And it's just sitting there in my room and you look at that piece, tiny little piece, yeah. and you think about the history, the people who have touched sure, that, who have sure. rubbed a little bit of the sure. the uh, the edges off. Yes. And you think that this is this used to be someone's fresh coin and now it's lived its life. Look, that's true. I, I was I, again one of your colleagues this morning. I, I said, "We're only 
three generations away from an entirely different... My grandfather was born in 1884. Mm. And yet I knew him and listened to his stories. So we're only... You know, it's so close and yet so far. Yes. Isn't it? Yes, absolutely. That's why I'm interested in family history. And and the changes that we will see going forth... Sure. ...is... I mean, even for me, like I'm, I'm 26 yeah. and you go back and you look at what life was like yeah. for me as a child yeah. and now what young people, you see young people going around in shopping centres, their kids, they've got their iPads and that is their life. Yeah. And we look at that and we go, oh, come on, you know, like, you know, get in the real world. <laughs> but what are their grandkids going to be looking at if they're in a well, stroller? Absolutely. And I, I'd say in one of my presentations about Incor, I, 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 I did a, a sl- um, PowerPoint slideshow. And I said, when I w- went through uh, in-core training, I was taught semaphore. Um, now it's drones. How oh. far is the difference between mm. doing this to send signals mm. to drones taking photos? I mean, it's a huge difference in such a short time. Mm. And drones are another whole issue. People freaking out about people <laughs> flying over their houses and all that type of yeah. stuff. At the moment, there's this big thing happening at Area 51 where people are there and they're talking about trying to get into the base and there's this whole internet meme around it yeah. where there was like a million people said they were going to be there and yeah. they're going to storm and, the base. And 12 and, turned up. And yeah. 12 turned up. <laughs> <laughs> it was an absolute failure. And that's what's happening with the youth of today. They can't commit to anything. Well, but, you know, I mean, how many of us actually do have a corner of our brain that says, you know, UFOs, did they really land and did did the CIA hide it? Do you know, I mean, we've well, all got a, a corner of our brain that says that, even though we a, probably... As a former part of ASIO, what are your... Uh, <laughs> have you ever walked past a door and there's I, just been a... I was never allowed in that in that section. <laughs> okay. You heard it here first, folks. So that section exists. <laughs> Ted, thank you so much, sir. I appreciate it. Good thank you very you. much. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, what an episode. Somebody stop us. We're on fire. Make sure you go and check us out on iTunes as well and leave us a five-star review because, let's face it, we deserve it. And we come, don't forget, I've stuffed that up. I haven't stuffed up the entire episode but we'll leave that in ladies and gentlemen head to the butterfield effect clips it's a whole new youtube channel where you can get little short snippets that are all about different things it's fantastic go and subscribe to that immediately ladies and gentlemen make sure you subscribe if you haven't done that already like the video do something with your life and uh anything else connor tour Tour. i'm on tour ladies and gentlemen thank you connor i'm going everywhere we're heading to the uk i don't know i might be there already who knows it's all happening ladies and gentlemen all around australia enormous amount of shows i'm absolutely everywhere i'm like a disease or i'm a bad smell i'm just everywhere around the country and uh that'll do goodbye